Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for such a great crowd again today, Father. And I just ask you to pour your anointing out, Father, on, on me to deliver this and for all of us to hear it, Father. For it's, I think it's from you, Father, and I think it has meaning for us as a, as a body of Christ and as cowboys for Jesus. So, Father, just open our eyes and our ears. Let us see and hear your truth today. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, how many of you remember what I started off with last week? What's, what's the one thing? What? Partnering with God. Yes, that's what we're talking about is partnering for, with God. But I started off last week by asking how many of you had opinions? How many of you have opinions? <laughs> you still don't. <laughs> uh, well, I, 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 after I said that, uh, I talked about, you know, our opinions are the, the single most thing that, that uh, keep us from knowing all of God's truth because we'll take our opinion over his truth if we're not very careful. And uh, I said I don't have a scripture for that, but someone gave me a scripture for that this morning, okay? So that's the reason I'm going back to it. I want to give you that scripture. It's Romans 11:25. It says, for do not but... For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant. I'm not saying that if you have an opinion, you might be ignorant, but should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion. And if we have an opinion, we're usually wise in it because we think we're right. So I just encourage you to, to be careful that your opinions are, are able to be uh, overcome by God's truth and that our opinions don't keep us from hearing God's truth. And that can happen. I've had it happen to me, and I've seen it happen to many others, where we have such a strong opinion, and we've accepted our opinion as truth, and we come up against the Word of God where it differs with that, and we say, well, that's not what I think, and, and we take our opinion instead of his truth. So I caution you about that, okay? Um, I'm going to review quickly. Uh, the scriptures from last week, I cut them real short. I, the reason I didn't get through last week is because there were so many great things in these scriptures that, that I had that I, I just elaborated a long time on them, and so we didn't get through. But uh, I feel like I need to just give you a brief uh, summary this morning. Uh, it is, you know, partnering with God in life. This is part two. And I got three points, and the first one is God uses men. The second one is, why does God use men? Which men does he use? And the third one is the qualifications to be used as much as he wants to use us. Amen? So i just tell you that so you know where we're going, and maybe it'll help you understand where we are better. So quickly, uh, I started off last week with Genesis 1, verse 26, and this is under the, the, the topic of God uses men. And I don't think it's hard to establish that, that nearly everything, if not everything, that God does on this earth, he does through us, through men and women that are in his body of Christ. Amen? Uh, if he wanted to, he could do everything himself and bypass us, but he chose to work through us. And sometimes I think we don't get that fully. So I just got a few scriptures that help me to to really zero in on the fact that he uses us in, in, in almost all cases. So, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the, earth, over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over all the cattle, over all the earth, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, and he made him male and female. He created them. Then God blessed them. God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over everything that moves on the earth. Amen? Amen. So God put it all there. He put it all there for us, and, and he wants us to do it. Uh, look at John, 15, John 5, verse 19. Most assuredly, I say to you that the Son of Man can do nothing of himself. If Jesus couldn't do nothing of himself, we can't either. Uh, but what he sees the Father do, whatever he does, the Son does in like manner. 
For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself does, and he will show him greater works than these that we may marvel. Amen? Uh, John 14, verse 12. Most assuredly I say to you that he who believes in me, the works that I do, you will do also, and greater works than these will you do because Jesus went to his Father. And, uh, and whatever you ask in my name, Jesus said, that will I do that the Father may be glorified. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Uh, he intends for us to do even greater works than he does, and I can't elaborate. I won't get through. Uh, Colossians 1, verse 16. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions, whether principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that all things, that in all things he may have preeminence. Uh, my one question is, is, does he have preeminence in your life? You are one of all things, are you not? And does he have preeminence in your life? And what does preeminence mean? That means that he's the most important thing to us, supposed to be. Amen? Be careful not to let anything crowd him out. Uh, John 15, verse 5, uh, verse 8, actually. Uh, By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. I'm sorry, I should have started at uh, at 5. Verse 1. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. Uh, And in verse 7 says, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit. Uh, I'm not even going to ask you the question. Philippians 4, uh, verse 13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Are we aware of that, and do we have that in our mind all the time? And do we, just, do we think about it? Do we know that we can? Uh, Matthew 6, 9 and 10. Uh, that's the Lord's Prayer, you know. It says, Our Father in, in, in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Okay? That's what we're supposed to be doing, church. We're supposed to be bringing the will of God in heaven to this earth. Amen? And how many of us know that right now in this day and time, we need a lot more of his will on this earth. Amen? Amen. And whose job is it to get it here? It's ours, individually and collectively. And if we don't start doing a better job, uh, it's not going to be fun. Uh, so that's, that's part one of God uses men. Is there any doubt in our minds that God wants to use us practically exclusively to do his will on this earth? Uh, anybody? We got to get that. We got to know that we're the ones that are supposed to be doing it. We heard that on the video that we were watching in Revelations this morning, that it's unequivocally our job. Point two is which men does he use? Well, he uses those that do the following. Uh, Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven, 37, uh, that he uses people that love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and that love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, those are the ones that he uses the most, the ones that love him the most, that understand what he's done for you and makes you want to do what he wants you to do. Uh, James 2.18. You got, how many of you know you've got to have faith to do what God wants you to do? Why, why is that? It's because you have faith that he's going to be the one that does it and that he will do it through you. If you don't believe that, we won't do much. Um, I'm going to cover this a little bit more because I think this one's important. And this is still review from last week. He says, but some will say you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. Uh, And then it goes on. It says, you believe there's one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and they tremble. But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Some of us don't want to know it. And I said last week, I never noticed that do you want to know I always thought it said, do you know, oh foolish man, that faith without works is dead? But I think some of us don't want to know that. 
if we don't want to work, then, and if we're lazy and, and we're just not really putting God first in our life and we're not willing to do the things that need to be done, uh, then maybe we don't want to know that. Think about that. Uh, but it says, um, verse 22 says, You see, do you see that faith was working together with his works, Abraham's works, and by the works of faith he was made perfect? Because the scripture uh, was fulfilled, which says Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. Uh, the body without the spirit is dead, just as faith without works is also dead. Amen? And that brings us up to where we're going to start today, which uh, is in 1 Thessalonians 2, uh, verse 3. And we are on point 2, which is, what kind of men does, does God use? What's the qualifications? Uh, 1 Thessalonians says, uh, he says he, uh, he uses men with a pure motive for our exhortation did not come from error or uncleanness, nor was it in deceit. Uh, he's talking about motive and calling. You know, God calls you, but sometimes we do things without him calling us. Sometimes we do things to, to be noticed. Sometimes we do things for our own ego. Sometimes we do things because maybe he gave us a gift of mercy and, and we we're so anxious to use our gift, we use it indiscriminately. Uh, we, we have to be called by him and we have to hear his voice and know what he's calling us to do. And then he can use us. Verse 4 says, but, but as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, do we realize we're entrusted with the gospel? Even so we speak, not as pleading with men, but God who, treat, who tests our hearts. For neither at any time, did, did, this is Paul talking, did we use flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak for covetousness. Uh, I don't think I even need to talk about the number of people that do that, do we? There's many, many people that, that use the, 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 the word of God and, and uh, the gifts of God for their own benefit, and that's not what he wants. We have to have the right motive and the right call. Verse 6 says, nor did we seek glory from men. We do it because God wants us to, because we love God and we want to serve him and we want to do what he calls us to do. Um, either from, from you or others that we, when we might have demanded as apostles of Christ. They didn't try to use it in any way. But we were gentle among you, this, this is the benefit right here. This is the, one of the traits that you need if you're going to be a good servant of God. We were gentle among you just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children. When we encounter uh, a, a lost person or a fellow Christian who's going through problems, uh, how are we supposed to talk to them? How are we supposed to minister to them? This says, just as a nursing mother cherishes her own child. You know, if she just said a three-year-old, just as you, you deal with a three-year-old or a two-year-old, it might have been a different story. But um, a mother nursing her child, what's she going to do? She's going to coddle him. She's going she's gonna to be sweet. She's going to talk sweet to him. She's going she's gonna to just minister to him and love him as she's nourishing him. Amen? And that's what we need to do when we're talking to, to each other in anything about, about how we're living or what we're doing. So affectionately longing for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives. You can preach to people all day long. You can tell them about the word of God. You can, you can tell them what they ought to be doing. You can tell them what they should have done, what they shouldn't have done. But if you don't sacrifice your life and lay down your life and, and let you be a part of their lives, he says, but also our own lives, because you had become dear to us. As you minister to people in this way, people become dear to you. And it creates a deeper relationship and it gives you the ability to speak more and more into their lives if you foster that relationship, if you listen to what God wants you to do and don't just go off on your own uh, talking to them as you want to. You have to hear God's voice and talk to them. Verse 9 says, For you remember, brethren, uh, our labor and toil, for laboring night and day... I hate to tell you that, but, but servants of the Most High God have to be available night and day. You have to be there when the Spirit calls. You have to be there when the hurting call, when the, when the 
the bereaved family calls, you have to be there. That we might not be a burden to any of you, we preach to you the gospel of God. And we can't do anything else but preach the gospel of God and be a witness and a testimony for him. Amen? Second uh, Timothy 2, verse 15. It says, be diligent to present yourself to prove unto God a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. What does that mean, rightly dividing the word of truth? Uh, it, it means specifically that when you preach out of one scripture one day and you preach out of another scripture another day or you're, you're using a scripture to give somebody a truth, you have to give it to them in a way that it agrees with every other verse in the Bible. The Bible never contradicts itself. And if we see a scripture over here, uh, and, and we see a scripture over here, and we think that, they, that they're in opposition to each other, or they're, they're not the same, or not saying the same thing, then we have an opinion that's in the way. And we're not understanding one of them. We may not be understanding either of them. They have to match, and if they don't match, we don't say, well, God made a mistake. We don't say, well, you know, uh, God used men and those men just, you know, they, they didn't do it right. That's not true. The scripture is God breathed and it all matches each other. Every scripture has to measure up to the, to the other one. And so we have to keep digging and searching until we get rid of our opinions and we're able to see them truly as God intended them. And you have to find where they match, where they mean the same thing, or we're misinterpreting them. And that's not rightly dividing the Word of God. Rightly dividing the Word of God is studying it until you get to where it all matches. And, and if and if they used to tell me, you know, if, if you get a jar of uh, water and you pour some sand and dirt in it and you shake it up, you know, you can't see through it. But if you set it up on the shelf, all of the silt settles out, all of the dirt settles out, and it becomes clear water again. And sometimes we have to do that with Scripture. If we can't make a match, sometimes it's best just not to worry about it right now. Set it on the shelf and ask God to show you. And uh, I've done that a few times, and he showed me sometimes three or four years later what it meant and what it was and what I thought was totally different from, from what, it's, what it really said. Amen? Are you all getting this, any? Uh, verse 16 says, but shun uh, profane and idle babblings, for these will increase to more ungodliness. Don't get in any arguments. Don't just go babbling about the word when you, when you don't really know what it's saying, when you haven't studied it. You, can quote, you know, a lot of people can quote scriptures, uh, but they don't, they don't even know what it means, and, and, and they, don't, they don't match it up. Um, and, and it says, uh, their, and their message will, will spread like cancer. Hymenius and Philetus uh, are of this sort, who have strayed from concerning the truth, saying that the resurrection is already past, and they, over, and they overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands. Uh, we need to be careful that we put out the right gospel, that we tell people the right thing. And, and, that, and if they believe a different thing, we don't need to argue with them about it. We just present them with the truth and love them anyway, even if they differ with us in some area or the other. As long as we got the basics of the blood of Jesus and the cross right, and, and we're trusting him and have a personal relationship with him, we don't have to argue over the rest. Let each person come to his own conviction before God. Amen? Amen. That's the way we stay in unity. Um, it says, nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands. Having this seal, the Lord knows those who are his. That's why it says in Romans, don't ask who's going to go to heaven and who's, gonna go, who's not going to go to heaven. Uh, because God knows their hearts and we don't. If, if I look at, at uh, this beautiful wife of mine and I say, man, she is so sweet and so wonderful. I know she's going to go to heaven. There's just no doubt in my mind. I'm saying she doesn't need the blood of Jesus to get her there. And if I look at somebody else and I say, boy, and that guy is so mean, so weird, so evil, there's no way he can go to heaven. I'm saying that the blood of Jesus is not strong enough to take care of his sin. And if it's not strong enough to take care of his sin, it probably won't take care of mine because I was no better at one time. Amen? Amen? So think before you judge people. But we have to put forth the, the real gospel. And, uh, and, and let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. And uh, sometimes iniquity kind of clouds the issue, and we don't really know what it means. 
but it, what it means is, is it's a, a, a quality by implication, the act of moral wrongness, uh, of character or, or a, a life or an act. Uh, and, and we have to, to do our best to follow Jesus and to follow Jesus' way, but we have to know that the blood of Jesus took care of our sin. We can't get wrapped up in trying to be so good that we can please God, because I got news for you. You can't be good enough to please God without the blood of Jesus. Amen? And the more we know that and the more we preach that, the more people are going to respond in the right way. Verse 20 says, uh, I don't know if y'all really want to hear this or not, but it says, in a great house, how many of you know God's house is a great house? In a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, which I know all of us are, okay, but also of wood, clay, and some for honor and some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified, and useful to the master. Do you want to just serve the master in a kind of indiscriminate way, or do you want to be useful to the master? I don't know about you, but I want to be useful to the master. And if I want to be useful to the master, I have to make some choices and decisions about whether I'm going to live my life the way I want to or whether I'm going to live my life the way he says to. And, and you know, that's not talking about working my way to heaven. It's just talking about uh, my motivation. I'm motivated because I know what Jesus did for me. I know what I was, and I know what he did for me. And I know that I can stand here before him righteous today, no matter what I've done in the past, only because of the blood of Jesus, not because of any works that I do or anything that I do. I can't do anything to make myself righteous. My righteousness before his eyes is just like filthy rags, like an open sepulcher, like, like a rotting, decaying body. That's what he sees as my righteousness if I try to get by on my righteousness. Do we understand that? And if you really get that, then you have a love for him that makes you want to do the things that he wants you to do. Amen. But that's the motive that we have to have if we want to be good servants of the Most High God. Um, prepared for, uh, useful to the master, prepared for every good work. See, when you understand that principle of the blood of Jesus and, and the the, the way he took away our sins, when you understand that, you have a, a different heart. You have a heart that can, can love someone who's, who's pouring their heart out to you and, and is in all kind of trouble and stuff. You can deal with them in love and not, and not look down on them. You know, when, when, you, when you're ministering for God, you should never look down on or look surprised when somebody's confessing sins to you or telling you about their things. You, you can never frown and... and and let them see in your face any kind of dis, displeasure with them. They have to see the love of Jesus in your heart and in your eyes. If you're going to be effective with them, if you're going to be able to help them, you've got to say, yeah, there but for the grace of God go I. And you've got to mean it and know that it's the truth in your heart. And then you've got to be willing to catch them by the hand and teach them if necessary the things that they're doing wrong without condemning them and teach them how to do them right, and teach them what the Word of God says about it in a loving way, and, and get them up out of the miry clay, and, and lift them up to understand that Jesus has taken care of all of the bad stuff in their life. Now just go forward and live for Him. Amen? Uh, James 1.12 says, Blessed is the man who endures temptation. Why is that? If anyone cleanses himself from the latter, the verse we just read, he will be a vessel for honor and useful to the master. Uh, and and we, we, we want to do that. We want to resist temptation because we love Jesus so much because of what he did for us. Uh, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor can he himself tempt anyone. Excuse me. I'm sorry, it's hard to preach when your nose is running. Um, 
Nor, nor can he himself be tempted by evil, nor does, he any, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desire and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is full grown, it brings forth death. Uh, you know, that's a scripture that's kind of scary, isn't it? That's one of those places where you have to, to uh, discern, the, the rightly divide the word of God. Uh, because some people can get carried away with that if they've sinned or if, they're, if they know they've sinned and they've got sin that's, that's daunting them, they can, they can get worried about that scripture. So you have to put it together with the blood of Jesus and what Jesus says about he'll never leave us or forsake us and nothing can separate us from him. Verse 16 says, But do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. What's the most perfect gift that anybody ever gave? Where did he come from? It came from above, amen? Every good and every perfect gift is from above. It comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. If God gives you something, it's not going to go sour. He put that manna out there every day, and, and it only went sour if they didn't use it right, amen? They, he provided it for them to eat, and they eat a certain amount every day, and as long as they did it, it was good, amen? Uh, of his own will... He brought you forth by the word of truth that you might be the kind of first fruits of his creatures. He brought us forth of his own will. God chose because he wanted to to bring us forth, to bring you forth. You're no accident. Nobody in here is an accident. Uh, you may not be walking with him the way he wants you to. You may not be uh, acting the way he wants you to, but he brought you forth because he loved you and because he wanted you to have a great life. Amen. And the more we surrender and submit to him, the greater the life gets. Um, so take heed, you know, it says, uh, excuse me. Let no one despise your youth. Verse 12. Is that where I am? Hmm? I did it again. Oh, okay. Of his own will he brought us forth, thank you, by the word of truth that we might be of kind of first fruits to his creatures. So that's, that's the kind of person that he's going to use. So what are the qualifications? You know, those, those are kind of qualifications, but when we're doing those, he's going to use us. But let's look a little bit more to qualifications. First Timothy 4, verse 1. Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits, doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. Uh, and, and what are they doing? They're forbidding to marry, and they're, communi and they're commanding people to abstain from foods that God created. Uh, what does that sound like to you? It sounds like legalism, and legalism makes people fall away quicker than anything. Uh, you, you can't earn anything from God. Amen? So it goes on and it talks about grace. And grace says that these foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing is to be refused if it's received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Now that's talking about foods, but... But it applies to anything that you're legalistically trying to do. And if we preach legalism to people and tell them, you have to do this if you're going to be a Christian, you have to do that, you must do this, uh, there's, only, there's only one thing you've got to do to be, to be a Christian, and that's believe and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross. And there's a lot of other things that we can do that are wrong after that that will affect the quality of our lives, but it won't affect... Our eternity, it won't affect our relationship with God. His, his relationship, people, the, the, these people that are, are legalistic, they're going to fall away. They're not going to be able to endure to the end. But, but we can because we know and, and believe the truth. 1 Timothy 4, verse 6. The, uh, the heading in my, my Bible on this says, A good servant of Jesus Christ. Amen. So verse 6 says, uh, If you instruct the brethren in these things, you will be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished in the words of faith, of the good doctrines which, have carefully, which you have carefully followed, but reject profane and old wives' fables 
and exercise yourself towards godliness. How do you exercise yourself towards godliness? You read the word, and you look at the word, and you say, well, that, that one doesn't apply to me. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to tithe, or I don't want to, you know, love my neighbor. Uh-uh. You look at the word, you receive the word, you do what the word says. And you, why do you do what the word says? You do what the word says because you love Jesus, because you know without him you're going to be in a mess of trouble. And you can't do it on your own, and you can't be good enough. And, and when you get there, you start loving the Lord in such a different way that, that it changes your life. It changes your heart towards people. Uh, but godliness is profitable for some things. What does it say? All things. Godliness is profitable for all things. Um, having the promises of the life that now is and of that which is to come. So, so godliness is not just profitable for eternity. It's profitable in our lives right now because if you're living a godly life uh, to the best of your ability, good things are going to happen to you. If you're, if you're living a wrong life and sowing bad, rotten seed, what's going to happen? Bad stuff's going to grow up in your life. Amen? Does that separate you from God and his love and his righteousness? Uh-uh. Not what my Bible says. Uh, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance. For to this end, we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially those of the, uh, who believe. Uh, verse 12 says, let no one despise your youth, and I kind of put in there, and, or your old age. Uh, but, you know, did any of y'all know that there's no retirement age in the kingdom of God? Amen. We're supposed to serve till we drop, and then we get promoted. Amen. So pray for us to be able to do that. But be an example to the believers in the world in conduct, in love, in spirit, in purity. Till I come, give attention to the reading and exhortation to doctrine. Do not neglect the gift that is in you. You have a gift in you. If you've trusted Jesus, you have a spiritual gift in you that God gave you. And if you're not using it, uh, shame on you. He gave it to you to use. He didn't give it to you to hide under a bushel. He gave it to you to use, to, to serve him, to glorify him, to help your fellow brothers. That's how we love our brothers and sisters is by using our spiritual gift the way he wants us to. Amen? Uh, which was given to you by prophesying the laying on of hands by the, by the eldership. Meditate on these things. Think about these things. Give yourself entirely to them. You know, when we surrender to God and make him Lord of our lives, your life is no longer your own. Do we understand that? Yes. Who's does it belong to? Amen. He's your Lord and Savior. We, you, you don't get saved without making him Lord of your life. And, and a lot of people, that's where I missed it the first go around. I, I, I got saved. I trusted him. I knew him as my Savior. But I, I never learned he was supposed to be Lord of my life. I thought, I thought my mother was Lord of my life. And, and it didn't work when I left home. I didn't have a Lord. Amen? And that's what got me in the biggest trouble. we got to know he's Lord of our life and that we surrender our lives to him when we get saved. And that that means we die to ourselves and we live for him. And if you're going to be a, a, a good servant of, of God, you got to die to yourself. It's, life's got to quit being about you. And you've got to live for him. Uh, Meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them that your progress may be evident to all. If your progress isn't evident to the ones you're trying to minister to, you're going to have no credibility. Uh, 1 Corinthians 3, 9. We are fellow, we are, for we are God's fellow what? How about partners? Is that kind of similar? We're God's fellow partners. What's our end of the partnership? Sure. To do what he says. What's his end of the partnership? To do it through us as we're obedient and offer our bodies as that living sacrifice to do what he calls us to do. Amen? Uh, we are, for we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. According to the grace of God, which was given to me as a master, a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it. You can't worry about whether you get credit for what you build on what you do. Because you may, you may 
give, sow a seed in someone. Someone else may come along and, and be at the place at the right time to, to lead them to the Lord. And then somebody else may come along and disciple them and teach them. Somebody else may minister to them when, they're, when they run across a stumbling block. We, we're, we're all God's workers, and we all work together, and we all do our part, and we don't worry about the other part that's somebody else's job. Amen? But let each one take heed to how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And when you're ministering to people, if it's not all about Jesus Christ, then you're not going to get very far. Uh, I, I love to counsel, and, and the reason I love to counsel because I have discovered that when somebody comes to me with a problem, uh, their problem is that they're not surrendering to Jesus. Their problem is that they don't know the Word of God enough. Their problem is that they haven't laid down their lives. And if I can teach them how to do all those things, they're going to get well and they're going to get over their problem. If they want just a, a methodical thing they can do to help solve their problem, I can't help them. If they want to get in touch with Jesus enough that he'll solve their problem, I can help them. Amen? Because, and I love to do that because I love to see people get it and then get better. Um, but each one take heed how he builds on it for no other foundation which can be laid other than that which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw, each one's work will become clear for the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test each one's work what sort it is. Are you ready for your, your work to be tested by fire? If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work, if anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved Yet so is through fire. Do you know what that means? That means if you're lollygagging in spiritual things and, and you're, you're working with the wrong motive uh, and you're not being effective and you're not doing it the way you should do it or whatever, whatever you're doing that, that's not exactly the way God wants it, it means that that, that work's not going to do much good. It's not going to do you any good. But it doesn't mean God's going to wash you out, Okay. The work won't go anywhere, but God still loves you, and you will be saved. But it's not going to be as fun a, a thing that you go through on the way to getting there as it could be. Serving God with your whole heart is the most rewarding thing that, that I've ever found to do. That there's nothing that matches knowing that God's using you to make someone's life better and that you're helping people in that way. And, and, and if your motive's right then it's all good. If you're doing it for the wrong motive, you're not going to get as much out of it. They call that codependency, I think, if you're doing it for the wrong motive. Uh, anyway, verse 18 says, Let no one deceive you, deceive himself. Do any of y'all deceive yourselves ever? If anyone among you seems to be wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. You know what that's saying? Don't think more highly of yourself than you ought to think. And that's written in another place in the Bible. But let him become a fool that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he catches the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise that they are futile. Therefore, let no one boast in men, for all things are yours. Let no one boast in men. You know anybody that does that? You can tell right away because they're talking about themselves instead of Jesus and they're wanting you to, to praise them for who they are and what they've done instead of praising Jesus for who he is and what he did. Amen? You can pick them out real quick. Um, for all things are yours. Let me start over there. Therefore let no one boast in men. For all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos, Cephas or the or the word, the world of the world, or of life and death, or of life or death, or things present or things to come. All things are yours, and you are Christ's, and Christ is God's. Did, did you get that? All things are yours. Where do all things that are yours come from? They come from God. They come through Christ. So 
Don't get caught up in your own wisdom. Don't get caught up in your own, own ministry and what you think you ought to be doing. Find out what God wants you to do. Give him the credit for it. Start doing it. And, and as long as you're dependent on him and working for him, all things are yours. And you're Christ, and Christ is God's. We can't lose if we ever get it right, get our priorities right, and our motives right. We can't lose. We can have fun doing it. He'll watch over us. He actually does it. We just have to surrender our bodies and, know, and trust and believe that he will do the work through us. Amen? Uh, I'm almost through. Um, verse uh, 4, or chapter 4, verse 1. Let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. Faithful. Say faithful. faithful. You have to be a faithful servant to serve God. Who wants a servant that's, that's there one time and, and not there another time when you need them or if they call in sick that day and, and they're not on the job? Uh, how many of you would, would, would hire a servant or, or want a servant that, that you couldn't depend on all the time? Hello? It's getting quiet in here. Faithful. You know what faithful means? Faithful means if the phone rings at 3 o'clock in the morning, you answer it. Faithful means that if somebody needs something from you that's a real need, that's a, a spiritual thing or just as a friend, and it's in your capacity to do it, you do it, whether you feel like it or not. And if you're not in a position where you can do that, you find somebody else that will do it for you. Faithful means that God is first, last, and always, and that you put him there. Amen? Um, he be found faithful. But with me, it's a very small thing that I should be judged by you by, by, or by a human court. In fact, I don't even judge myself. Some of us need to learn this part. Some of us judge ourselves too much. Well, you know, your opinion of yourself limits you as much as anything. If your opinion is, is that, that you can't lay hands on somebody and see them get healed, then guess what? You're not going to lay hands on them, and they're not going to get healed. Somebody else might get to do it, but you won't. You have to believe that God will work through you, that he wants to work through you, that he chooses to work through you, and, and you have to submit yourself a living sacrifice, trusting him and do what he leads you to do. Uh, I learned that the hard way. Uh, I had a, I, I still feel like to this day it was a word from God. I was, it was a long time ago, but I was with a man that, that had a, a withered arm and a withered hand. And, and I felt like I should pray for it to be healed. And at that time in my life, I, I didn't have the, the courage to do it because of fear that it wouldn't work. And, uh, and I regret that till this day. And uh, I believe it was God. I believe he wanted to do it right then and right there. And, uh, and, and I didn't do it. And all I can do is say, God, I'm sorry. But I can do something else. I can make up my mind that, that whenever I hear a little voice in my head saying, do this or do that, I will stop what I'm doing right then and do it and let the thoughts of anybody else be hanged and let the whatever consequences there is be hanged. Just, I'm going to do what God says to the best of my ability. Amen. That's what we have to do. That's a being a living sacrifice. And I was not a living sacrifice that day, and I have regretted it ever since because I, I, I pray that God brought somebody else that was obedient to that man, but it wasn't me that day. Amen? Those are hard things to, to get by. You just have to believe in the blood of Jesus. Uh, Therefore, judge nothing before time until the Lord comes who will, who will both bring light to the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsel of the hearts. See, God knows your heart, and you can fool yourself about your motive, but you can't fool God. None of us can fool God. Then each one's praise will come from God. Uh, Do you want your praise to come from God? Uh, I hope y'all didn't receive this in a way that thinks I'm fussing at you and trying to push you. I just want you to know the truth. I want you to know that, that we're all supposed to be servants. You know, Some people think that, 
that the preachers are supposed to go out and do all of the stuff. Well, we're not. We're supposed to equip you to do the stuff. And that's what I'm attempting to do today is to convince you that there's things that you as a, as a, just a believer, just a, just a worker, just in God's field, are supposed to be doing. And, uh, and, and just imagine if we all got excited about doing what God wants us to do. And I don't know how many people are in here today, but, but even, if even half of us got excited and started increasing our availability to God and being willing to serve him, uh, what would happen to this, to this little body? What would happen to this little community? What would happen to this county? Uh, I just believe we need to pray and, and ask God to show us what our part is, what our ministry is. And I don't know if anybody here wants to, to make a different commitment to God today, but if you do, I'd like to pray with you. Anybody that, that is bold enough to just say, you know, I haven't been what I, what I know I ought to be, and I want to be. Anybody? There's a few of us. Amen. Well, just pray this prayer with me. Say, Father, if never before, I want to totally surrender my life to you. I want to be the kind of vessel that you can use and the works won't be burned up. So, Father, stir me up with a new hunger and thirst for your word. Stir me up with a new hunger and thirst for your righteousness, Father. And guide me and direct me. Let me hear your voice clearly. And you tell me who to pray for, who to touch, who to, who to say something to, Father. And you give me the words when, when it's time, Father. And I choose to trust you and say what I think I hear you saying. And let everything else just be hanged, Father. I'm going to listen to you and speak what you say when you say it, Father. So guide me and direct me. Fill me with your spirit. Uh, baptize me in your spirit and give me all the power that's required for me to be a servant that you can say well done, good and faithful servant someday. In Jesus' name, amen. All righty. How many of you glad you came to church? Hallelujah. How many of you going to come back next Sunday? All right. Well, we're going to have communion today. Brother Dennis is going to come and lead us in it. And uh, thank you for listening to me and letting me babble. Amen. By the way, y'all come back now. You hear after communion when you leave. Y'all come back now. We're going to uh, celebrate the Lord's Supper. As the uh, men bring the table over. Communion at Cowboys for Jesus is open to everyone that has received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. If you name him as your Savior and Lord, you're welcome to partake here at the table with the Lord. The Bible says that in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, on the night that Jesus was betrayed, that he uh, got his disciples together and they broke bread together. The Bible says that he took the bread and he gave thanks to the Lord. And he said, this is my body that is broken for you. And the reason that we celebrate his death is because it's because of Jesus' death that our sins are forgiven. And we celebrate it with a broken body, which is broken for our healing, for our strength, for us living for him. And we celebrate it with the juice or with the wine with the blood of Jesus, symbolic of his blood. And it was that blood that was shed so that our sins are forgiven, so that we have no condemnation in Christ Jesus, so that we are free from the bonds of Satan and of sin and of death, free to serve him with our whole lives, just as Pastor was talking about. He took the bread and he said, this is my body that is broken for you. He said, when you do this, remember me until I come again. Let's partake in the bread together. Remember Jesus' body that was broken for you. Remember that there's healing and there's health in Jesus Christ. Father, we praise you and thank you that you sent your son to die on the cross for us so that we could live daily 
for you. Help us to serve you in the way we live our lives. In Jesus' name. Said in like manner, he took the cup. He said, this is my blood that was shed for you. The disciples didn't understand it at that time. But their sins, both past, present, and future, are completely forgiven through the blood of Jesus Christ. So receive forgiveness as we drink of the cup together. Father, thank you for your blood that was shed through your son, Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of our sins. Thank you, dear Lord, that it is a life-cleansing blood. Lord, even as we read in Revelation this morning that our robes of our self-righteousness are washed in the blood of Jesus and made forever righteous in your sight. Thank you, dear Heavenly Father, for Jesus' blood. In Jesus' name, we thank you. Amen. It ends by saying that after they had eaten together and remembered Jesus, that they sang a song and then they departed. So we're going to ask them to lead us in a song. Stand to your feet. Sing with all your heart as unto the Lord. You can return your, uh, your cups to the table if you'd like at this time. Are we ready? Are we ready to lift our voice and pray? And acknowledge the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Have you been to Jesus, the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusted?
Thank you for coming to Cowboys for Jesus. And you know you're dismissed when the preacher says, Y'all come back.